I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and and enjoy enjoy the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hey, everybody out there. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Chip over here has got a little sinus thing going on. Yeah, Chill. my nose is super congested, so Most hopefully stuffy. you all can't tell. I've been a mouth sleep, a mouth gaper. Mouth gaper? Yeah, where you sleep with your mouth open, you wake up with like drool. What do you sound like? Slinging <laughs> next to you, like... No, I just wake up because I sleep with my, I never sleep with my mouth open. So when I do, I wake up and there's like drool. You went for a diac in your mouth? A diac. Maybe. I wouldn't, (laughs) I wouldn't trust my sleeping open mouth with putting a dick in there. Only consensual, of course. No one, don't just, no (laughs) one, no one is invited to shove a dick in your mouth. Yeah. If you see me sleeping on an airplane with my mouth open, do not come up to me. (laughs) Someone's like, I heard you're like, she said she was okay with it. Looking for a diaca. No, banana's okay, okay? No, that is still fucked. I mean, you can send a, ra- ra- a, a random banana stabbing in the mouth. Maybe someone could just pour a little bit of wine in there while it's open and you'll be like, mm. Till I choke and, yeah. No, let's not do that. We're going to be sleep- We're gonna be on an airplane together soon. We're going to Germany, y'all. Uh-huh. We are going to Germany and Paris. And we're going to record a bunch of podcasts while we're there. Are we recording a bunch? I don't know. <laughs> we might get wind of, of recording some podcasts. Here's there. some fun facts about April night. We don't have the ability to say no to anything, and there's opportunity everywhere we go, and we're often together when we travel. So when we travel, we end up packing things in our schedules, and we don't sleep a lot. No. We record a lot of podcasts. This is why I'm paying the price of my rundown. Like yeah. my, my system's totally run down from 18 days of travel this month. Yeah, eighteen days. Yeah. So I, my dog literally was didn't recognize me when I, I saw him last time. He recognized me, but he was like kind of like give me the old fuck you eyeball, <laughs> like dirt stink eye. I was like, dude, I'm your mom. Yeah. And then he peed in my bed, <laughs> <laughs> like despite me because he it's hasn't like, done that. Bitch, you've been gone. Yeah, I'm like, f- he really did. It was like this very. I don't blame him. It was it, a, a, a manipulation of of my. My my mind and his little dog brain. He's mad. I don't I don't blame him. He is, and he's in love with your uh, friend's dog over here. Oh yeah, I'm dog sitting. Yeah, I'm a, the dog sitter. I had Monty he's, here. Who I can say his name because he's a dog. And <laughs> I sent Monty our little old 15 year old mascot, and now I have another dog. I didn't tell you this. I walked out of my apartment the other day, and I was it was 7 a.m. I was taking Legend uh, out to go do his morning duties. And it was right after we got back from Brooklyn and some guy gets out of his car. He's like, it's not as uh, it's not the same as being in Brooklyn, is it? And I like look at him. I'm like, oh, damn it. I can't. And he, and he totally. Fan? Yeah, he was a podcast fan. I was super tired and I just got back like the night before. Oh, and um, he was like talking to me, talking to me and then about whatever, a few things. And then he he saw my dog and he's like, oh, is that legend? <laughs> oh, he knows. <laughs> and then I was really kind of excited but super awkward because it was 7 a.m. and you're tired. It's the morning and I'm not yeah. a morning person. I didn't have coffee in my hair. When I walk out of my house in the morning, you ask yourself two questions. Homeless or hipster <laughs> when I walk out of my house? Or a homeless hipster. Or a homeless hipster because I look hilarious. My hair is just like, Bruh! and then Legend looks the same kind of. He's all... You think he's a homeless dog, or he could be a hipster dog. Yeah, but your uh, your your friend recognized you, podcast fan. Yeah, we love, so love podcast. If fans. He's listening right now. Thanks, podcast. Thanks, fan. podcast fan. Sorry if April was a little confused at seven a.m. She's not her shiny self at that time, especially after Brooklyn. Yeah, that was that was an exhausting trip. That was. Um, speaking of travel, April and I will be teaching uh, once again on Friday, October twenty fourth, here in California, in Atascadero, California, at Diamond Adult World. We're teaching orgasm one hundred and one. So again, this is Friday, October twenty fourth of two thousand nineteen. Go to diamondadultworld dot com and you can sign up and learn all about orgasm one hundred and one from April and I, and learn from us live 
In the flesh. And a Tascadero, if you don't know where it is and you are it's somewhere in Central California, it's actually such a cute little town. It's uh, coastal. I believe it's like super close to the coast. It's and coast. It's like, not right on the coast. No, it's, but it's inland, such a inland cute right off town. of 101. Yeah. And it's easy to drive to if you're in Santa Barbara or Paso Robles. So if you're anywhere near that and you want to check it out, spend a Friday night with your with your date night or on yourself. Uh, you Come can learn. go out with some. Let's go out with some friends. We'll teach you some things. Yeah. yeah. We always have fun. Come learn. Come play with us. Are you all ready for a sex question? Yep. I like this sex question because I have a personal story to tell about the sex question. I am a 26-year-old female. I've had about five men. I've had about five men I've had sex with. Three of those five men have performed oral sex in me, and I have never really liked it. It does not make me self-conscious or uncomfortable. Honestly, I'm just kind of bored. I love giving blowjobs, though. That kind of oral is fun for me. I've told girlfriends over the years about this, and they all look at me like I'm crazy and make statements that the guy must have no idea what he's doing. I am currently 3.5 years into a relationship with my now fiancé. He is 31. We have a great sex life, and I have tons of orgasms with him, just not from oral. I've tried to be directive and patient, but I just get bored and want to move on after a few minutes to more fun activities. Am I just a weird exception, and receiving oral is not my thing? Could I learn to like it? Or are my girlfriends right? He just doesn't know what he's doing. Ooh, I'll say something brief about this, and then I want to hear your story because I'm excited about it. Tell me, Chip. So I think if, if my advice would be, it might not be for you. That's okay. I would say don't give it, don't write it off entirely. As Amy's mentioned in podcast past, your body's always changing, and sometimes your desires are switched off for certain things at certain periods of your time of your life, and then they could go uh, s- totally be turned back on without you even realizing that that's happening. So I would say you don't have to practice it on a regular basis. Don't write it off completely because you may like it five years, five months, five days from now and not even know. Now, as far as knowing what he's doing, uh, I would say I don't know if there is something that you believe he could try that would be different. Maybe you could make some suggestions. It sounds like uh, there's tons of videos. There's instructional videos. I think Nina Hartley actually has a really great one. Tristan for, Termino has one. Tristan too. Termino has one. Yeah, yeah. that happen. actually, I've had partners in um, my past watch those videos and try some of the techniques, and they've been really effective. Uh, so there's options, and if you don't know what you like because you've never actually liked oral, no, they did. Oh, they That's did. My, this is my question. So three out of the five men performed oral, and I didn't really like it. So are you saying that three of the five did oral, and you didn't really like it, and that the other two just never did oral? Or are you saying you actually liked what the other two did? Because if you receive oral from two people that you actually liked it, well, what were they doing? And how do you remember what that is and redirect new partners to that? Or like, what, what do you, I can't really tell. And if, and if all of those people or three of them performed and three out of the three, three out of the five performed it and you didn't like it from any of them because they're not really saying exactly if the other two re- had performed it. Mm-hmm. If the three performed it and three times she was not into it or interested in it, yeah, perhaps... Yeah, I mean, there's so many different variables here. Yeah, I mean, if you are if you did actually enjoy it with those other two people, and, and it's unclear if that's what you're saying, then what were they doing and how do you... Uh, and, or I mean, not even just what were they doing. What was the scene like? What was the energy like? Where where were you at that point in your life? I think all these things add up and actually contribute to our sexual experience. Um, and then if not, maybe those people didn't go down to you. I'm also curious about what bored means for you. Does bored mean... Because a lot of people, including myself, have a receiving barrier. And so when I'm lay, you know, laying there and receiving and I'm not doing anything, which is what oral sex is, someone going down on me, often I'll have this thing come up like I need to be doing something. I need to be you know, touching their cock or their body or their bits. Or now it's, only, you know, it's been five minutes. Now we should move on to something that involves both of us. And I have to really work against that. And for me, my theory on why that's there is because the first three people I had sex with never went down on me. They never offered it. And I didn't ask for it and I didn't really know much about it. And so when people, once people started to do it, I had like a worthiness barrier around it. There was a block to it. Almost like I wasn't worthy of it because I was so unfamiliar with it. And I was only familiar with things that involved their penis. And so I'm curious what bored is, is bored. You going through a receiving barrier is bored. You just not feeling anything. You're kind of numb. And so of course you're bored. Cause you're like, I don't really feel much. What does bored mean to you? And then why I relate to this, so um, I'm someone who had my receiving barrier. Oral sex for me, I'm like, it's very similar to this person, but to me it actually have, has often felt ticklish, pokey, 
um, brought up like a squeamishness in me. Uh, and, and I've had definitely a number of occasions where it has felt really good. But for the most part, it's something that I was utilizing to get my pussy wet so I could move on to something else. Um, or I was also using it to like please someone else because they wanted to do it. And um, there is, and there, and there, and there again, there's times when I enjoy it. It's not that it was all terrible, but it was very easy for it to be too much stimulant, too much ticklish, pokey, whatever. And um, I recently, you know, and I've talked about getting my sex drive back, back, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the people I'm seeing right now that I've been seeing for the last, gosh, month and a half now, I don't know, since we're in Salt Lake City and I'm, put my number on receipt and <laughs> picked up on someone a month um, and a half wow it's been a little while this person is the very first person who has gone down on me where i have the feeling oh my god i want you to do this forever oh it's the very first person i've had many mouths on my pussy in my in my lifetime and i've had some i think some very skilled mouths on my pussy and there is something about this and, and actually going back to the last podcast we did with jaya and Jaya has her erotic breakthrough quiz. I took that quiz and I'm an energetic is like my number one um, erotic blueprint. Right. And I think so energy has a lot to do with it in, in terms of me feeling safe, respected, um, the energetic state, how the other person is arriving. If they're trying to energetically take from me or physically take from me, are they there? Can I feel that they fully just want to give and receive and it's not about them? Um, and I think that there's something with this particular person i think that what they're doing is being really present they're not in a rush they're not just going down to me so i do something for them they're doing because it, it feels really good for them and i can like totally pick up on that and there's just something there and, and they're just present right they're just paying attention to what my body's doing and then they follow that thread. they're not doing all the things that they heard that they should do uh, and it feels so good to be in this place of and i say this to them like oh my god i i don't I'm really I know this might sound like I'm trying to butter you up, but you're the first person. I'm just like, I could have you eat my pussy for hours. And so oh. my long winded story of like April said, anything could change. This doesn't mean you have to break up with your partner of 3.5 years, but maybe there's more going on there that you need. Maybe it isn't skill. You know, maybe you need more safety, relaxation to feel more respected. You, do you need to feel more like you don't have to do something or instantly give back or be something else? Or is there pressure to have an orgasm from them or from you? Or um, maybe you just can't come right now with and, oral and, and that's okay. Everyone's nerve endings are so different. Like everyone thinks that we're all the same, but some people have more nerve endings internally, some more externally. I mean, the clitoris has the majority of the nerve endings, but everyone is really, really different. So don't be so hard on yourself to think that there's something wrong with you. And just because your girlfriends absolutely love it, you're different. You know, you're different from them. And it's not the easiest thing to orgasm from only uh, oral. Um, there's a lot of techniques that could be utilized with the oral. If it, if the, if they're only if the partners of previous um, episodes, oral episodes, haven't used enough fingers, like yeah. fingers actually inserting fingers and using the pressure from your fingers mm -hmm. as well can be really helpful. Go go listen to the episode that we did. It was how yeah. do you eat pussy like a champ? Yeah. How do you, or have your partner listen to that too? And you know, in, in lovingly say this isn't because I think you're doing a terrible job. You know, it's like. You know, hey, obviously you like to go down on me and I'm still learning what my body likes in this department. So maybe we can listen together and try some things. I like, I like that. It's a good episode. How do you pussy like a chip? So I'd say don't write it off. Keep, nope. keep revisiting. And I invite you to take a break and then maybe revisit it in another few months. Maybe and, you'll really like it. And you could learn to like it. I sure did. Um, all right. You ready for a bio? This oh, yeah. podcast is fucking awesome, by the way. Oh my God. She blew my mind. And that is... Like, like, She's so totally good. blowed my uh, blow, blowed. She blowed her I mind. Like I need to blow my nose. Um, <laughs> I need. She blew my mind in yeah. this. So you stay tuned. You're gonna love this. She's incredible. So, Dr. Jolene Brighton is a leading expert in post birth control syndrome and hormonal birth control related problems, as well as women's health naturopathic medical doctor, practicing physician, and speaker. She is also the author of Healing Your Body Naturally After Childbirth, The New Mom's Guide to Navigating the Fourth Trimester, and her latest book, which we are obsessed with, Beyond the Pill. To learn more, visit Dr. That's D R Brighton, B R I G H T E N dot com. But first, 
This podcast is made possible by your super. Did you know that 9 out of 10 people don't eat enough fruits and veggies? When you don't get the proper nutrition, you increase your risk for chronic illnesses. And despite being pretty health conscious ourselves, it's still difficult to get all the whole foods our bodies require with our busy lives. That's one of the many reasons why we love your super. They make it easy for us to get the nutrients our bodies need to thrive. Your Supers superfood and plant protein mixes are made from organic, whole superfoods and nothing else. I love knowing that the Super Green Mix is keeping my immune system healthy and strong, and it's also an easy way to get a serving of greens. I add it to my morning smoothies, on top of salads, to my morning oats, you all know I love oats, and anywhere in between. And don't even get me started about the Chocolate Lovers Mix. And guess what? Our listeners get 15% off when you use code SHAMELESS at YourSuper.com. That's Y-O-U-R Super.com with code shameless for 15% off go get your health on and now back to the show all right everyone episode time now fun fact about this episode this episode we actually recorded i don't even know a couple months ago and april and i loved it we were so excited about it and and we both read jolene's books and we were just so excited and then the external hard drive crashed and we lost it and we did not save it to the cloud. Also known as myself. I did not do that. I did not do that. My fault. And we lost it. And so we are finally doing this again and we're really excited about this. We just couldn't let it go. We just like, we have to share this information with you. So um, Jolene, welcome back <laughs> to the Shameless Sex Podcast. I know. Can we get the rights to the like Slim Shady song? Like, guess who's back? <laughs> yeah, guess who's back, back again. again. Yeah. Jolene's back. <laughs> well, I'm excited because I get to sing the Dolly Parton Jolene to you maybe at some point as a yeah. surprise again. Yeah. But although my voice is a little funky today, well, I'll give it my best. Crazy is that my son, who is six, has actually never heard that song. And I, I didn't. I just never thought, I think he's heard the uh, Ray LaMontage version, but I never thought anything of it. And it came up on a Spotify playlist just yesterday. And he was like, why does that woman keep saying your name, mom? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I got to spin a whole story. I was like, oh, when I met Dolly, she was like, mm, that Jolene girl, let me write a song. And then about 10 minutes in, he's like, are you for real? I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not at all. But why are you trying to take her man, mom? Yeah. I know. Well, that's the thing. Like we had that discussion before whenever people are like, did your parents name you after that song? I'm like, uh, God, I hope not. Cause if you yeah. listen to the lyrics, she is scandalous. That Jolene is scandalous. And poor Dolly. Poor Dolly. She's been, Dolly's been married for, I think 60 years to the same, a man. Which yeah. One? Try again, Jolene. You yeah. <laughs> Jolene did not succeed. <laughs> Um, so let's, uh, it's more, we've, we've already heard the answers, but maybe you have different answers now, but for our listeners, will you tell our listeners about yourself and how you got to be where you are today? Sure. So I am a bit of a nerd and always have been. So I've always been really interested in the human body and, um, like loves, oh man, I have to say there's some Instagram accounts I was just sharing with my team this week that I, sh- I love to follow in their autopsy accounts. And my team is like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, this has always been something I've been fascinated in. So and the funny thing is, is that I actually never set out to be a doctor. Um, I actually thought I was gonna be a pharmacist for a minute there. But um, <clears throat> so for me, like I was a sick kid, had a lot of digestive issues. It took a decade for them to figure out I actually had a infection in my stomach uh, called H. pylori. So uh, these medications now, these proton pump inhibitors, and H2 blockers that we know are troublemakers and are actually being recalled, uh, some of them from being over the counter. I was put on them at 17 when there was no studies done on women, um, let alone a 17 year old gal. And I was told that this was it, like this, I would be on this medication. This is how I was going to live the rest of my life. And I then started making observations about my diet and that propelled me into nutrition because although my doctor said to me that diet had nothing to do with any of this, I was like, no, there's something to this. And so that's when I set out to study nutrition and, um, you know, in that I was like to my doctor, I'm never going to take a pill every day. Silly you doctor. And then they were like, Hey, but you know, those really heavy, painful periods that you hate and how you don't want to have a baby. We have a pill for that. And I was like, sign me up. <laughs> I'm, I'm down for that. So I started birth control. I like swapped that out, started birth control. Um, and they spent 10 years on the pill. I'm really grateful for it. It's great that we have options. And, you know, because of that option, I'm a first generation college student. I was able to become a naturopathic physician. And 
I'm one of the first women in my family not to get pregnant in her 20s. So that's all winning. Thank you, birth control. (laughs) But as you read in my book, I also had my, you know, like so many of us, my pill story, my struggles of being on birth control. And it wasn't until I got to naturopathic medical school and I was in my first year and I remember sitting there. I still remember. It's like that dun, dun, dun movie moment where, you know, the professor says, women are only fertile one day out of the month. They ovulate one day, the egg lasts one day, and that's how we get women pregnant. And I was like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I've been suppressing my hormones every day for 10 years, thinking I could get pregnant at any point. I actually don't understand how my body works. And I had this epiphany that you shouldn't have to go to medical school to understand how your body works that you're living in how your menstrual cycle works and that no one had ever told me how birth control worked and and what was going on with all all of that in my body. So I come off of birth control. I end up with post-birth control syndrome, lose my period for the first time in my life, develop cystic acne. And I'm like, what is going on? My doctor's like, you probably have PCOS. You've always had it. I didn't. That's not what was going on. And because I was in medical school, I was like, no, I don't fit the diagnostic criteria for this. And it can't be that. But of course, I thought I was a freak, thought I was the only one. My doctor did a good job reinforcing that until I got into clinical practice and I saw how many women struggled to break up with birth control. And I got this reputation of being the doctor who believed women's birth control stories. Now, part of this is that you know I'd done two years of clinical rotations in a homeless youth clinic, which is a lot of dispensing of birth control. So whenever people are like, oh, you're just, you know, the easiest way to dismiss this inconvenient conversation that we have to have. Because what I say is inconvenient. Like if you're just like, I just want to use this and not have to think about it. It's really inconvenient when I start sharing like, but this might go on and that might go on. You got to like do more work to take care of your body. But the fastest way to dismiss me is to say, well, she's anti-birth control. And it's something where, I mean, and I've had people that get mad at me because I'm not anti-birth control. And I have to explain that like when you spend two years working with women who live on the streets, who are disproportionately affected by the, you know, taxes on tampons and, you know, really like they don't have dignity when they menstruate because of, they have to choose food or a pad. And in addition, they're at really high risk for sexual assault. They don't have a door that locks at night behind them. That birth control is amazing for these women in their situation. And it's something that I'm really grateful to have that experience because it has always really been embedded in me that I don't know what happens when that woman leaves my office. I don't know what her life is like. We don't share everything with our doctor. And there is no way that even as a doctor with what I know, that I could ever know enough to tell a woman how to live her life best. Mm-hmm. And and that, you know, she shouldn't use birth control or should. Like, yes, there are hard and fast of like, if you, like chapter eight in my book, if you have these genetic mutations that mean you're at higher risk for a clot, we can't, we can't be using hormonal birth control with you. Like that's not safe. And we can have those conversations. But this idea that it's got to be all or nothing, I fully reject that. I'm like, I think we can advocate for access for better technology, better reproductive technology, while we also advocate for education and informed consent. So that's really my jam is I want women to understand, you know, what goes on with birth control, how it works. But I also want them to understand that you can work with your body. Your symptoms are not your body's way of betraying you. Your symptoms are your body's way of talking to you, saying, hey, I need some help here. And there's opportunity. I, you know, spent a decade celebrating how I just told my body what to do. And I waged war with it because those painful periods that I mean, they kept me out of school. I bled through my clothes. I mean, that sucks. Like bleeding through your clothes is like, uh, no man really can ever, like there's no level of empathy they can really relate to with that because until it's happened. And and the thing is, is that when I came off of birth control, it's like, I felt like I had PTSD. I was like, wait, I was bleeding through my clothes like as a teenager. And here I am now, uh, you know, in my late twenties, bleeding through my clothes again. Like it's... uh I mean, any woman listening that's ever had that experience knows. I mean, there's a time of the month we can't even wear white pants. Like, what is that about? (laughs) So of course I was happy to be on birth control and be like, bye, bye, bad periods. I don't want anything to do with you. I completely am with you with the bad periods. In my, I'm now 37 and I only just started implementing some of your suggestions from your book, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit uh, into my life to help with my gnarly periods. I've been 
off birth control. I think now since I was, so I'm 37, I think I got off when I was 32. So it mm-hmm. hasn't been an extreme amount of time to tell exactly what my body will do. I was on birth control for 15 years and different forms. I was on the pill, I was on the ring, I was on the IUD and I had never had a gnarly period in all of those years. And I think because as a teenager, it didn't really kick in. I was an athlete. So my periods mm-hmm. were, were really inconsistent. And then being on birth control, obviously, I didn't know what they would be like. They were light in like a couple of days and I never had cramps. Now it's... Isn't that amazing um, though? (laughs) Yeah, it was was amazing. And then I talked to people, I think even, and Amy will, I'm sure, talk about her experience, but some some of my friends only have periods once a year or they barely get them at all because of the types of birth control, which all sounds great. Uh, and you've named some of the few reasons when you talk about gnarly periods, I'm like, I, I would eat birth control to not have that anymore. But there's different ways, of course, to avoid getting these really horrendous periods every month, which we'll talk about as well. But what are some other reasons? Uh, obviously, contraception uh, is, is another great one. Um, but what are some of the other reasons for taking birth control? And how can these, I guess, th- how can these items affect um, have like have negative side effects of the birth control. My question's mm-hmm. very disorganized right now because my head's like, <laughs> yeah, I think you so, get what I'm throwing down. <laughs> I totally got you. So, and I mean, what you <laughs> just said right there though, contraception, uh, you know, birth control was designed for spacing pregnancies or delaying pregnancies. And uh, I don't really think they ever designed it for a woman who never wanted to have a baby because when birth control was stepping out, like we were still supposed to be baby making machines. Machines, and that was our lot in life, you know, thanks society. <laughs> now women do whatever they want. And if you are a woman who's like, but I never want a baby, I ain't here to judge you. Totally. Like, you know, <laughs> I will say I have one. And after having a child, I'm like, oh yeah, I know now. I know <laughs> it's a lot of work. So here's the thing. That's how it was designed. It was never designed to be uh, what it has evolved into now, which is the pill for every female ill, as I call it. So whether you have heavy periods, painful periods, it might be because of endometriosis. Maybe you have irregular periods um, that could be due to PCOS, hypothyroidism, being an athlete, um, you know, what was once called the female athlete triad, which is not an eating disorder. It's just you're not eating enough to keep up with the energy expenditure, which is like, of course, when you're a teenager, like <laughs> the food is like, food is your only like rebellion and sense of control in, in many situations. Um, and so like, like, you know, people probably heard me say on other interviews, the crumb donuts story comes up a lot where I just ate crumb donuts for lunch. And like, I'm like, I really need to design healthy crumb donuts, like a <laughs> version of that to be like, I've talked about it enough. So uh, the other issues though, that we see that bring women to start birth control is acne. So whether it's cystic acne or like you just don't want to have a blemish for your senior prom pictures or wedding day. Um, We also see other issues with like headaches or migraines that can be cyclical. And, you know, certainly if you think about like anything is related to lady part issues or is hormonal in any way, that is when women are often past the pill. Oh, and that is the, the leading lady to step on the scene. So it's the most widely used, but we also have IUDs, patch, ring, shots. I mean, it's great that we have options, but we also need to have the full story surrounding all of this. And when it comes to birth control, I think it's really important that women understand that we don't actually know what happens when we leave women on birth control for decades on end and they don't ever have a period. Now, you might say, well, but I'm bleeding. I'm bleeding once a month. Yes, you are having a medication-induced withdrawal bleed, but you are not actually having a period because you're not having the full cycle. A period only comes after ovulation, after a cascade and fluctuations of hormones. And science actually hasn't answered that question. When I started birth control, my doctor was clear that I had a 10-year life. Like I could do the pill for 10 years. And then after that, no, the, the risk got too high. And when 10 years came, my doctor was like, yeah, no, you can just stay on it. We leave women on it now. And I asked, what changed in the research? Well, not much has changed in the research. This is just our new recommendations. And that was really startling to me. And so with that, you know, there was actually in Scientific American uh, just recently, I think it was after our first interview, um, that Dr. Kissling, who's a researcher, actually made a statement and said that, you know, long-term menstrual suppression via birth control is the largest 
uncontrolled medical experiment ever conducted. And I think that was a moment, like, I'm like, okay, I've been out here saying this for like years, but when a researcher comes out and drops that, that's when like everybody's like, hold up, wait, what? And that's what we see a lot. We see a lot of clinicians who are like, birth control is a gift. Just take it and say, thank you. And don't question it. And if you have side effects, that's you. It's not your birth control. And this is not a generalization across the board, but those clinicians do exist. And, you know, I'm sure there's women right now who are nodding their head. I've had these clinicians, um, who are like, no, those yeast infections, that's you. No, it was actually birth control. And in that though, we see the researchers, the people who do the research are the ones who are saying, no, In fact, we don't actually have significant data on what we're saying. Like we don't actually have, like we did not answer the question, what happens when a gal starts her period? Maybe it's irregular. Maybe she's 14. You put her on birth control and then she goes to menopause and she never once ovulates. We don't know. And it's, it's not, and this is what I'm saying. This is inconvenient, everybody. It's super inconvenient that I ask these questions, that I put this out there. And yet this is what we need to be demanding research to do, is to answer these questions for us so that we can understand. One example, also the side effects being like stroke, heart attack, yeah. death. And you're like, what? I remember taking a pill and hearing the side effects. And then when they say that's you, however, how many people are actually having those side effects? They probably yeah, won't well, review that. <clears throat> well, this is the thing is that, you know, we see that the stroke pulmonary embolism. So that's when a clot, you know, so clots will usually form in the veins. They get dislodged. They can end up in the lungs. That's a pulmonary embolism. Um, estimates are that if you have a pulmonary embolism, it's 20 to 25% of people die from that. Um, clot can travel to your brain. You can end up with a stroke. And so when we look at these things, like the risk of, you know, stroke and clots, like, and, and all of this conversation is really looking at healthy young female population. So understand that women who are listening, research is not saying you have a pre-existing condition of diabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome and autoimmune disease or anything like that. And saying like, maybe, you know, maybe we should study you. Yes. There's been some research with like, what's the impact of birth control with like lupus, which tends, that's an autoimmune disease. We tend to clot more, um, with coagulation issues with that, but it is something that's, it's really startling. And so we'll often hear doctors will say, Oh, the stroke heart attack risk. It's so minimal. Don't worry about it. Okay except we are talking about stroke and heart attack and we can screen for that. Now, in chapter eight of my book, I give a list of labs, one of which is factor five Leiden. When you hear these stories of my 19 year old, uh, you know, took the pill and three months later was dead, they likely had a factor five mutation. Now, this is something that I really get. You guys saw me. No one else can see me. I'm all flushed and I took off my sweater. Like I'm sweating talking about this because I get really upset at how often the parents who tell these stories are dismissed and it's swept under the rug. And it's like, don't talk about this. And the whole uh, basically uh, current and vibe is that if we talk about the side effects, no woman would ever take birth control. And then she's just so silly, she would get pregnant or she can't understand her body. And, you know, I have lots of patients that I review the side effects with, we screen for labs and they still choose to use birth control. And then I support them and we track that. Like, I don't think it has to be that way, but I've seen, you know, people say, uh, you know, in, in response to me saying we should really screen these things and Canada, an MTHFR mutation, which is uh, an enzyme that helps you process your folate. Uh, it's involved in folate and B12 metabolism. It's about 40% of the population has this mutation. And in Canada, so interesting. I was on a medical database and it was like, here's the, the list, uh, you know, everything you want to know about this uh, contraceptive, this pill specifically. Um, and here's the contraindications, everything for the US. And by the way, Canada also says MTHFR should be looked at. And if you have an elevated homocysteine, I'm like, yeah. So, but that's a thing that I wrote about in my book. I have US physicians telling me that's not a thing, but in Canada, like what, it's the same pill. Like what is, what is happening here? And so we can screen for these things. Yes. People say we shouldn't screen for it. It's frivolous lab testing. But I think if you said that to somebody who's lost their child to birth control and they could have screened for it and it could have been prevented, they would have given any amount of money to run this test. And a lot of times this test is like a couple hundred dollars. And this is something that when I have conversed with parents, I mean, I get lots of parents reaching out to me being like, thank you so much for the work you're doing. My daughter actually died it was dismissed. It, like I've been trying to advocate. I've talked with parents who are starting foundations around this and they're like, why 
can't we just screen this simple test? And, you know, I, I get hit with a lot of haters as I'm sure you guys do too. And I have to like, but I, right. We don't get up in the morning to serve those people. And I think I hold on to like these stories and these, like what women have said to me. And recently there was a woman who she actually put this in an Amazon review who had written me and she had a clot and was on birth control. And because of reading my book, she advocated for herself after being dismissed and sent home and told there was nothing wrong. And because she advocated for herself, she's like, I saved my own life just by having access to the information that my doctor had never told me that actually existed in this book. And that is why I get up every day because women deserve to have all the information. They are not stupid. They are very smart and they just need to have the information and view it through the lens of what is true for me and get that individualized approach from their doctor. Mm -hmm. So we launched into the big scary things. There's lots of other things that birth control does. (laughs) It's not big and scary. There's a lot of good things too. And then there's big and scary things. And um, one thing that came to mind for me, and this is not a hormonal birth control method, but I was on the non-hormonal IUD, the Paragard and, um, and the first round, I guess I got pregnant on it. So it stopped working at year nine, but um, well, I didn't stop. You know, it's not completely, it's, it's not abstinence. So, um, but I got a second one after getting that first one removed. And all of a sudden I had my face broke out like crazy, but it was almost like a rash. I was extra puffy and bloated, but any Western doctor was like, it's not the IUD, you know, it's, it's you. So, and this, so I'm bringing this, yes, to not even just, hormonal birth control methods, but things that are run by pharmaceutical companies who are, you know, probably funding a lot of the research and you know a lot more about this. And so, it, and then the doctors are the ones that only know that research. And so mm-hmm. they're, and so they're, so I've experienced that on my own. I looked online, thousands of women yep. experiencing the same thing. Their hair was falling out from the copper and the IUD, but no Western doctor that I spoke to would advocate for that. They're like, no, it's not the IUD. We don't, we don't see that. And so I was like, all right, but look at these women, you know, look what these people are saying. It's like copper poisoning almost, right? That's Slowly. What, I mean, that's what they were saying that it was, you know, copper poisoning or some sort of reaction to the, to the copper um, or, you know, and, and it causes inflammation in your uterus and that's kind of how it works in the first place. So, um, but just bringing that kind of a, around to, a lot of what we know is um, is biased information. And so mm-hmm. there's people like such as yourself who um, is kind of on the ground working with people and actually getting real, um, you know, experiential, real human uh, perspectives on what's actually going on and that there's so much value in that. And so I'm yeah, yeah. I'm just giving voices to the Well, and I'm glad people. that you bring up your story. I mean, this is why we all have to share our stories. And this is like, I mean, when I was like, come off birth control. I have post birth control syndrome. My doctor is like, yeah, no, you probably had these issues all along and you didn't know it. I'm like, no, 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 I don't No, That's not true. This is gaslighting. Like this is, this is essentially gaslighting. And when you get on the online forums, you see thousands of women telling the same story across different continents, never have talked to each other. The eerie thing is, is how how often they use the same language. Mm-hmm. Um, how many times I've had patients in my office They've never talked to each other. They're not in online forums. They're using the same descriptive language for what's going on. I mean, this is something where I'm like, we don't need a study to believe a woman's truth because the reality is, is that there are always outliers. There are always people who do not respond as predicted. Mm -hmm. And so the best advice that I give women is for any medical procedure, whether it's birth control or anything else, is to document your symptoms, write it down down. What is normal for you? Because then when things change and someone says to you, "Mm, no, you're just misremembering or no, that's like, that's you. That's not this. You can be like, nope, it was X, Y, and Z on this date. I had this intervention. Now this is what it looks like. Like, and it's inconvenient to have to like document all this stuff and keep track of it. But you kind of have to be your own little mad scientist in a way with your body of like, I need to write all of this down. And we have to take this with us to the doctor. Like I have totally been in doctor's visits where, I mean, I went in, was like, this is my objective. And like, here's what's going on. And then by the time I left, I was like walking out with other prescriptions, didn't even know. I was like, what just happened in there? Like what, what is going on? And that was like most of my (laughs) twenties was like, what just happened in this doctor's office? I don't even know. Like this thing, like, this is what I'm being told now. And with the, you know, with a copper IUD, what's really interesting 
is that medicine has medicine has had a very convoluted history with the female body. They were like scared of it, don't dissect it, let's shame it. Let's like um you, do you guys ever listen to Joe Rogan? Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah, where he had that uh, stand-up uh, comedy little bit where he was like, a tampon was obviously invented by a man. Yeah, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, just be like, let's just, like everything else is like, let's let it flow. And then a tampon's like, shove something up there and just no, stop it. Like, shove a cotton dick in your vagina. I was like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. pretty much what like. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Oh, somebody's going to listen to this and be like, she went there. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I saw that stand-up and I was like dying during it because he's like no way that a woman would invent that I was like you're totally right dude. yeah I mean I I definitely I yeah I put the, I had to record it and put it on Instagram I have I've watched that several times it was hilarious yeah. um but you know the uterus has been I mean once upon a time we were hysterical and our uterus wandered our body and <gasps> um and we were asexual creatures oh lo and behold our clitoris is giant like it turns out it's not this little button um and even now it's I mean I meet with women all the time that they're like I'm having these problems. And my doctor said, well, you're not going to have a baby. You're done having babies. Just cut it out. You don't need your uterus. It's yeah. not, like, why is the female reproductive system always negotiable, but like Viagra is available, like widespread because heaven forbid, like men's reproductive system not be working. Like mm-hmm. this is something that like, and you know, I, before anybody eye rolls and is like, are we going on a feminist patriarchy rant? No, no, no. But this is the facts. And like, we have to examine that because even now we've um, just last year had a rodent study come out showing that rodents could navigate a maze until you took out their uterus. And once you took out their uterus, they were like, I can't get through this maze. Like, what is going on? Oh my and so now we're starting to investigate the uterine brain connection, which mm-hmm. why, are, why are we so like throttling and, and cautious about all this? Because this is the kind of thing that if we show that like, okay, if you lose your uterus, you might have cognitive de- deficit, then it potentially holds us back because society has spun the story that we are the lesser in some way. And that is just inaccurate. We're actually meant, I mean, the world would be a better place if men and women were equal playing fields, like since like day one of humanity, which, you know, they were, and then we got a little lost in that because we complement each other so well. It's not that anybody's the lesser or weaker. We actually have to work together. That's how we're designed. Oh my God, Jolene, you're just like my spirit animal. I just <laughs> love you. Uh, so let's talk about c- kind of a juicy topic, which is sex drive, libido. And I know speaking from my own experience, I feel like as soon as I got off birth control, the pills specifically, I felt like yeah. a light switch had turned on and I was, and I've always been more sexual in nature. I distinctly remember though, being on the pill and being like, is this thing on? Like, I can't feel anything. Like I wouldn't be ever turned on. It would take yeah. forever. And I, at the time I never blamed the birth control. I blamed a lot of other things. And so I would love right. to listen to kind of the correlation between sex drive, libido and the pill per se from your, from your words. Yeah, well, I just want to say that I love that you're like, let's get into this juicy conversation because birth control makes all the juices stop flowing. Right. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, vaginal dryness is is really um, common. I actually just published an article um, at drbrighton.com on 14 plus reasons why you have pain with sex and how many women wrote me and they're like, thank you for saying in the article that it's normal to need lubrication. I'm like, yeah, nothing is like what Hollywood presents us. Um, there's all this talk about like, you know, men see porn and then they have this like distorted view of sexuality. But what, but what is showing all day on the televisions and in the movies is that women, a man just looks at you and then like, oh, they're like, you're just totally in the mood and you had an orgasm 10 minutes late. That is not how female anatomy or the body works. And so understand that we all need lube, especially certain times in our cycle. There's no shame in that, but definitely check your lube because you don't want to be introducing endocrine disruptors. Um, um, so like in my practice, like if we're doing a gyne exam, we don't even have, like we, we have the, I like to say cleanest lube, uh, possible, but at the same time, I don't want anyone to feel like that's a stigmatizing thing about the cleanliness of your vagina. That's not what we're talking about here. I just mean like how, how pure can we get it? Like, you know, spit coconut oil, like, you know, those kinds of things that people use. It's, it's better than like things that are introducing chemicals. Into- I bring Uber lube to my gyno appointments, by the way. I literally Good. do because I don't like what they use. And totally. I recommend people doing that. I love Uber lube. 
too. Yeah. I mean, obviously we, we love them, but um, do you bring your own to your own gynos? You don't have to answer yeah. that. Well, my actually, my, <laughs> so my, um, my gynecologist, or, well, my PCP who does my gyne exams, she actually was the student who worked under me while I was in clinic. So I spent two years uh, basically with her one-on-one training her. So I was like, who am I going to trust with my vagina? The person that I know that super one. well. <laughs> yeah. um, and so no, she's got, she, her stuff is all on point um, with that as well. And that's what you usually find if uh, your a naturopathic physician is doing your gyne exam is that we're very, very aware of what lubricants we're using because this is a mucous membrane. And if you think about when we deliver bioidentical hormones, we'll often do this in a topical form. And that's something that like is well absorbed. So you have to consider with environmental toxins. Plus like, you know, some of us don't want to give up like our hair product or our nail polish and things like that. So if you don't want to give that up, then switch the lube. And there's like so many more products out there and they actually work a lot better. Um, I'll just say that if you're on the pill and you um, have issues with yeast infections, it's something that's like glycerin, like the sugary stuff based, not a good idea. Um, And then of course, depending on the kind of condom you use, we all want to be using condoms unless we are STI screening monogamous kind of relationship, then you're going to want to evaluate your um, lube as well. So with birth control, vaginal dryness, yes. We also see that there can be loss of libido. That's, I always joke, that's the sneaky way it worked. Like I went through my twenties, like my orgasms were so pitiful. They're like, I, well, a lot of women tell me their 30 something year old orgasms are much better. Um, but you know, people are like, Oh, you figure out your body. I'm like, or we came off birth control. It could be that, (laughs) but so we can have an inability to orgasm. We can also have pain with orgasm. The loss of libido really comes down to the fact that when you're on birth control, it will downregulate the production of testosterone and upregulate the production of sex hormone binding globulin. This is a protein that your liver makes, not because your body hates you, but because it's trying to protect you. So when you take birth control, the pill specifically, there's actually a genetic alteration that occurs that causes you to increase that protein because you're taking a high enough dose of hormones that your liver takes a crack at detoxing it, but it's still enough to shut down brain ovarian communication. And if all of those hormones were left to float around, they could be some major troublemakers for you. So your body being really wise is like, let's make sex hormone binding globulin, grab onto that. So that will drop your libido. And then in addition to that, you know, for some women, they come off, sex is better. Um, For some women, they come off, the libido doesn't come back because the sex hormone binding globulin stays elevated. Um, Interestingly, if you meet your partner on birth control and you're on birth control and you're with this partner, when you come off of birth control, you're more likely to report sexual dissatisfaction. And when you start looking at all the research studies together, what's interesting is that as women, we tend to choose men. Okay, this is going to be kind of funny, but um, we tend to choose men based on their money and their intelligence while we're on birth control. So Uh, why is that? (laughs) I'm like, somebody's going to be like, oh, see, those women are scandalous. No. I did a broke musician on birth control, so I didn't get that memo. Yeah. (laughs) You're like, that's because you were like, I'm going to make my own money. (laughs) But with that, I mean, what is that? That's the modern day age of selecting for a partner who can protect you and take care of you. But as you come off of birth control, now the way they look, that goes up in priority. Now you're like, you better be hot and you better be good in bed. And so women um, on birth control are more likely to initiate a divorce. And then when they come off, they're more likely to get divorced. So oh, <laughs> you did that. You did that. I totally did that. I Holy did that. Shit, you're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> I'm like putting my hand up. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my God, that I literally actually- happened like um, a year after. So, yeah. Wow. My mind is blown and that doesn't happen that often. Holy shit. I met, you know, the, the first guy I married when I, the first time I met him, I was not attracted to him. And I actually, when I got into this research, because, um, he had more, more feminine features. That's not why, I mean, I don't know. I just wasn't attracted to him. Who can explain the, the cocktail of con- attraction when you're a teen, you know? But then I got on birth control and we like met up months later. And then suddenly I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, I could be into him. Yeah. And then I came off of birth control and I was like, WTF. What was I doing? Um, And when I look back, I'm like, wow, yeah, his jaw structure was uh, much more narrow. And, you know, there were these, these differences where when I look at the research and when they have women on birth control manipulating faces and, and everything we know about attraction, 
birth control disrupts your MHC, uh, your, your perception of the MHC complex, which is what's in pheromones that tells us, yeah, I want to get with him. Because even if you don't want a baby, your body's like, I want a baby. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. And you're selecting for dissimilar genes. So some, something's going to give baby more variety, but when we're on birth control. This is the section of my book. This is your bad boyfriend part of birth control. Um, where, you know, I'm like, I'm not saying birth control is why you chose the bad boyfriend, but if you want to say that, you could say that. Um, but with that, when you're on birth control, you actually are selecting for men that are more genetically like your cousin and that's gross um, and weird. <laughs> and so every time I say it, I'm like, I can never like get over like how weird that is. But also I'm not judging anybody because I've been there. Mm-hmm. But it is something that we're now starting to see a lot of researchers question, well, what impact has this had on society as a whole? And um, Dr. Sarah Hill, who just came out with a book called This Is Your Brain on Birth Control, she's actually, her and I were in a conversation and she's talking about like, you know, for rentals, like apartment rentals, like birth control keeps people single longer. So for the economy, it might be better for that. Like there's all of these ways that birth control can be impacting things really positively, but we also have to be asking like, and what kind of negative impact has it had? And in all this research, if you're a woman listening to this now, this is just research. This doesn't mean this is your life or this is the way things are going to like play out. But if you do break up with birth control and then find you're not attracted to your mate anymore and something's going on, like you don't have to shame yourself and feel like you're broken. That's what we do so well as women, but you can have some curiosity around that. And I think if you know this and you know this, this is what's going on because you are this like very intellectual being in itself. Like this is something where you can be like, Hey, I can intervene sooner than later. We can go to counseling. We can go to sex therapy. We can do these things and like recognize what's going on because when you don't know, and you just think you you know, you're the broken one and something's wrong or you just fell out of love. And it's a, it's a very hard struggle, I think. And to have a way to understand, I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm like, why did I marry that guy? Well, there's a lot of reasons that went into that, but looking at like, well, your brain chemistry was also altered as well. And so, okay. Like we don't have to be like, oh girl, you're so stupid. It's like, okay. There was actually, it was a multifactorial event and we all did really dumb things at some point in our life and we can forgive ourselves for that. Now I do want to say, um, one thing that's really interesting about birth control that we should know in terms of the sex arena one, uh, definitely increased risk of yeast infections. So that can be problematic for your sex life. But research has also shown that if you begin birth control, the pill specifically, before age 16, you're about nine times more likely to develop vulvodynia. And vulvodynia is a chronic pain issue. So it's, uh, and it affects the outer genitalia. So it wouldn't be what we call deep dyspareunia, which is deep penetration, which by the way, for women to understand, sometimes that's a positional thing that like it's, again, it isn't like Hollywood makes it out to be, but if you're having pain at the opening with insertion or even with touch, like this is something worth exploring. And to understand that statistically speaking, women's pain is dismissed at a higher rate than men. We're more likely to be told it's in our head and be sent home. And that's why you need to work with a pain expert. So if you are having pain with sex, pain with orgasm, chronic pelvic pain, work with a doc who specializes in pain. They'll be way more on top of the research, but the research is really lacking in women's sexual health altogether. But especially with, uh, you know, pain that is associated with intercourse or pain in the pelvis. And if you work with someone experienced, they'll be able to draw from their experience and you'll be more likely to get help with that. And so I don't want any woman to like lose hope There are so many avenues and, you know, in in the United States, I mean, it usually, it takes like five plus docs for women to get the help they need. Like, so if you feel like you're on doctor number three and you're hitting your head against the wall, you're worth, keep going. You're worth it. Like you're totally worth it. That's such great advice because because doctors and you're a doctor they're they're not god or goddesses right they're yeah. they don't know everything so questioning is okay asking questions doing your own research and getting multiple opinions about something I think that's 
great advice that everyone they're, can really take. Yeah. And they're experts on the human body, but they're not experts on your body. And that's the thing is that you have to partner with someone who respects that you may be a deviation from the study. You may be a deviation from the algorithm. Um, you may be in the gray when they were taught the world is black and white. Yeah. Uh, I love your book, Beyond the Pill. I love, love, loved it. Uh, it was so easy to navigate. It wasn't like reading cover to cover where you need to study each piece. You make it really simple. And I would love if you can give our listeners a quick rundown of what people can expect from the 30-day program and a little insight to what that looks like. Yeah, it's really a get in and get out kind of book because when you have hormone imbalance, you don't have time to read 300 pages. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it was really funny as we were going through edits, they're like, maybe put the quiz a little bit further back so that women are drawn in. I'm like, put the quiz in chapter one. They take it. They go right to the section they need. They feel better. They come back a month later. They do a little bit more. Like, And so there have been women, it's designed both ways, which was um, really tricky and fun. But I was like, you know, I said to my editor, I'm like, look, if a woman has estrogen dominance and her PMS is off the chain and you tell her, hey, you got to read 200 pages of problems until you get to like the, the solution, she's going to rip the book in half and curse my name. It's not going to be a good scene. So in that, you really get in, you can take the quiz and you can go right into here's the, you know, diet, lifestyle um, and supplement protocols that can help. And we, if you are someone who wants to read it front to back, you can totally do that as well. But if you are really struggling with hormone imbalance, I definitely recommend, you don't even have to read the first chapter. Shh, don't tell anyone I said that. Just get in and take the quiz in chapter one. I designed the book to be with you for life. Like it is something that, I mean, I want this to be... I, how many of us have health books? I have a lot where I've read it once and I'm like, all right, I'm good. I really want this to be like, oh, wait, I've been good. Two years later, maybe I'm not. I need to troubleshoot. I'm going to go back and I'm going to just troubleshoot. So within the book, you're going to learn, I mean, it is uh, the first book to really detail women's health, hormones, how to go a different way other than birth control, how birth control fits into your life and how to stay safe while you're on it, how to navigate that conversation with your doctor, and then what happens when you come off of birth control. It's truly the book that I wish that I was given like when I started my period. Like it would have cleared up so much confusion in my life. And how many times all of us are like, I can't talk about this. I'm really ashamed and I'm, I must be the only one. When in reality, most of us are experiencing a lot of these issues. So I go through the book, um, you know, there's information, there's a whole chapter on post-birth control syndrome, how to avoid it, how to come off of birth control. There's the uh, period decoder chapter is what I call it. So if you've got heavy periods, you've painful periods, you have uh, irregular periods, what might that mean? What should you ask your doctor to investigate? What labs should you be asking for? And what can you do right now to, you know, start moving the needle towards health? Well, you wait for that appointment or wait for labs, which is what you're doing right now. You're waiting for labs, but you're like, I'm still going to be taking care of my diet, taking care of my lifestyle. Because the reality is, is that the things that keep you out of the doctor's office are not the things that happen in the doctor's office. They are the things that you do every single day, what you put at the end of your fork how you talk to yourself, how you move your body, how you sleep, who you follow on social media and who you keep in your inner circle. All of these things are determinants of health and they are incredible in hormonal health, especially. And I think that they just don't get enough play. And we think that, you know, we've got to take a pill. There's got to be a surgery or a major medical intervention. Let's be grateful we have those, but we also can take some personal responsibility. And so I provide you the tools to do that. Uh, my background is as a nutritional biochemist. So we always start with food is first when we're talking about nutrients. Then I talk to you about supplements. Um, I do. I have uh, charts in there that list multiple brands of supplements. Mine is one of them, but I invite anybody. Uh, you can't get these like all over the world. So I always invite women. You know what? We set up the website so you can read the label on mobile and you can go in to a health food store and just look at the label on mo mobile and try to batch it. And like, you know, in the United States, there's some of these natural health food stores where they actually have pharmacists who are trained in this kind of medicine. Same with France um, and, and understand herbal medicine and understand nutritional therapy and they can help you. And they'll actually, I mean, I have had um, pharmacists who actually message our customer service and is like, can you send us X, Y, and Z because we have someone here right now. We'd love to see these labels. And we're like, yeah, all we care about at the end of the day is that you get what you need and you support your body and you feel amazing because it has always been my belief that if we can heal one woman, 
she can heal an entire community, if not the world. Mm -hmm. And there are too many of us. I, for one, spent a good amount of time being distracted by my hormones, my period problems, worrying about them, dreading them, wondering if I'm normal. What if we could free up all that mental energy? Oh, dang. I think this world would be a lot better off. And so that's really, I mean, the book is so much about building your user manual to your body. You will learn about your adrenals, your thyroid, your liver, your gut. By the way, you need all those things as you enter into menopause. So even while your cycle is gone, this can help you as well. And when you get into the 30-day plan, I don't do dogma. Uh, It's not my jam. And I don't do this like that food's bad kind of thing. No, like what works for you is all we care about. And that's what I want to help you evaluate. So we will eliminate some foods and then you'll test them. I want you to always ask what is true for me. You'll test like, how do these self-care practices work for me? These stress reduction practices. I give a big old list. I'm like, pick one, try it. Like it's not all going to work for everybody. And so you're going to really put together your basically day-to-day life of like, this is This is how I have optimized my health and how I live by. And then there will be resources to troubleshoot as things come up so that you can course correct. Because like food poisoning happens. And what most people don't connect is that you can get food poisoning. You can develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as a result of it. And now we have a hormone imbalance. And so now we've got period problems and acne and our gallbladder struggling. And it's all coming down to what's in the gut is the worst. It I, is the worst. I have encountered more acne in the last two years than I ever have in my entire, even adolescence to adult, early adult life. So mm-hmm. it's frustrating. I will say that since taking some of the recommendations from your book, uh, I have seen um, an improvement. Obviously, it's still too early to tell. Uh, but the cystic painful acne, it's such a bummer. It's just... Mm-hmm. It's like a self-esteem killer too. So I just will, I will say that I have seen an improvement. So thank you for, for that. And will you tell our listeners or did, did you want to ask something? Okay. I wasn't sure if Amy had something to add. Um, where people can find your book. I'm sure it's at Amazon, but is it um, anywhere else? And, and are you going to have a, an audible version coming out? Probably hard to do there, with a quiz, but. Well, there is an audible version. Oh. And for, uh, oh. It's already out. And for everybody listening, you can get the audio anywhere, but wherever, you, wherever they sell audio, but you have to get Get the PDF downloads from there. Um, I get more DMs, emails, even negative Amazon reviews because people are like, I can't find the PDF downloads and this author didn't give it to me. I'm like, they didn't give it to me. I don't have it. <laughs> like, so um, you can get the uh, audio version. And then uh, you can get the book wherever they're sold. Definitely follow me on Instagram at Dr. Jolene Brighton because whenever I'm traveling in cities, I always pop into the bookstore and just sign a bunch of them. Um, And so there's... Well, actually, there's none floating right now, but there will be more to come. Um, And when you do, go to beyondthepillbook.com. I've got a bunch of gratitude bonuses there for you and resources to really help you along the journey. There's only so much you can put in the book. I mean, the book... Uh, it was 100,000 words when I turned it in and they cut 30,000 plus out of it. Um, and but I'm like, eh, we just like, we need more. And so we recorded videos. We did all kinds of extra things to really support women um, on that journey. Um, and then you can also go to drbrighton.com. Odds are, if you've got a lady part question, you've got questions about hormones at all, I've answered it there. So we've got tons of videos and resources. Um, I've been chuckling lately. Women are calling it the Google of women's health. They're like this. They're like, I Google something. It's kind of hard to find. I go to your website and I'm like, there it is. That's exactly what I wanted to know. And we always try to take the position of like, what's it going to look like to talk to your doctor? What are the conventional options? And then what are also the natural options so that you have options? I love that. You are such a inspiration and just such an important human. I'm so happy that you're doing this work and it's so it's so great. I hope our listeners all go and get the book if they're having any any adverse symptoms to birth control or hormones or um I, I, I don't know. I I found so much com- just I don't know, like a complete restoration of my body after reading your book and I think it's really important for anyone at any age really. If you're if you know 16 to 95, you can probably still find benefits. So thank you, Jolene. Thank you. Thank you. 
um, yeah. for take round two of having having you on our podcast. We knew this one would be the best one yet. <laughs> yeah, we we were just pre gamed before, right? Yeah, we just it as a warm up. <laughs> there was still new information because you're so full. You are a en- walking encyclopedia of information, <laughs> and um, you deliver it brilliantly. So thank you, and I hope to see you again soon, uh, and maybe have you back for the wealth of the thirty thousand uh, words that didn't get into your into the book. Uh, we can. I know we could have talked us so much longer. I think. Oh, we. In two hours easily. Yeah. No, oh, I will. I actually did block off two hours just in case. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we'll have a round two. Um, yeah, I would love to because you're just so brilliant. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brighton. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thanks again. You know, even though this it, it failed the first time, I just, for everybody listening, I just want to shout you guys out because you sent an email and you're like, we're so embarrassed. We're so sorry this happened. Yet it happened and we would like to just try again. Mm-hmm. I've actually, it's happened to other people. Um, and then I just never hear anything. Oh, and I'm like, geez. and then I reach out and I'm like, what happened? And they're like, well, I was too embarrassed. The whole thing crashed. Yeah. I'm like, it's okay. Yeah. You know what I've learned in life? You can't control a lot of things. And technology is definitely not one you can control. So I appreciate you reaching back out and that we got a second opportunity to do this. And, and now we save it to our external hard drive and to the Dropbox online. So <laughs> we have this covered, everyone. We're not going to lose this one. No, this one's, this not one's gonna work. going live <laughs> very soon. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. And we'll talk to you again very soon. I am, I'm sure of it. Thanks to all of our listeners out there for tuning in to Shameless Sex and being part of the Shameless Sex Revolution. We absolutely love you all. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.